My name is Walter Menteith. I'm a director of Walter Menteith Architects, Project Compass, and a lecturer at Portsmouth School of Architecture. Climate change rises and sea level make addressing our coastal defences an imperative. We need to consider how best to do this from the available solutions. This is a summary presentation that discusses and explains these issues in the Portsmouth context. It evaluates what is currently known about the authorities' existing proposals, the research that's been undertaken into these, and outlines viable and more appropriate alternative opportunities that could be considered. Portsmouth is a truly unique island city, one of only two similar island cities in Europe, which, like Venice, is founded on maritime power. This distinct legacy is relatively under-recognised. With roughly 12% of Portsmouth's economy now derived from tourism, it is imperative to nurture its most valuable assets and amenities for the future, particularly the fabulous South Sea to East Knee frontage, so it remains one of the UK's premier urban seaside destinations. The city's environment and economy has always been shaped by people and their relationship to the sea. And it is this treasured relationship that should be enhanced. South Sea Common in particular, with its wide range of fantastic amenities and its delightful beach, transportation connections, along with the various monuments along the frontage, is a hugely distinct and extremely valuable resource for everyone. So, when considering the future, Realising the overall value of the beach, the frontage and common should be foremost. But the city is at risk from ageing sea defence structures and climate change induced sea level rises. The illustration here on the bottom right shows those areas of Portsmouth that are most at risk from coastal inundation on the basis of 100 year predictions. To address this problem, Government have now agreed Portsmouth an allocation of around £86 million for sea defence works along roughly 4.5 kilometres of the South Sea frontage. In addition, roughly £5.6 million has already been allocated for implementing a final design for the area that is known as Flood Cell 1. The current sea defence strategy is based on a Portsmouth City Council and Eastern Solent Coastal Partnership, that's ESCP, policy of holding the line. And this is being applied quite rigidly. Notably, government funding is also allocated on the basis of saving lives and property. Other social values, including benefits or disbenefits to the population, amenity or economy, are not an equivalent priority. I now want to explain some of the current sea defence design strategy. We know about this based on detailed drawings forming contract documents for the employment of their main contractor and design team. So, based on these detailed drawings, what do we actually know about the current proposals at the human scale and what are their implications? I'd like there to explain some of the following drawings to you. The first drawing is a plan. In the top left hand corner of it, there is a box, and in that, there is an insert which shows you where this particular main detail is located along South Sea frontage. The main drawing on the page then shows the sea to the left and the common to the right. There is a wiggly line running diagonally across the page, and that wiggle and the area extending back to the road. Clarence Esplanade is a plan of the concrete revetment on the beach. Further down, there are then two circles with numbers within them, and these are where the section lines are then taken. We'll be looking at the sections in the next drawing. The column on the right provides various notes for aid in reading the drawing. The note that's been highlighted, not for construction, is an indication of the work that it's expected will be done by those tendering. In essence, this drawing has been produced to determine contractual appointment. 
What we see in the second drawing is two sections. In both sections, the common is on the left and the C is on the right. In the top section, section 3.1, we see the construction of the concrete revetment built on the beach. In this, you can see on the right hand side 20 steps leading down to the beach from a flat concrete promenade area. At the back of this, there is a back wall to catch overtopping. This is to capture water from large waves that break over the revetments during storms, during which time the promenade would be unsafe. To the left hand side of this section, you can note that the height of the wall when viewed from the common is 2.4 meters high. This is the dimension directly of the existing Clarence Esplanade to the top of the back wall. However, it should also be noted that along Clarence Esplanade, the road is already raised above the common along the frontage by roughly half a meter. So if you add half a meter to that 2.4 meter height, that is the apparent height from the common. To the right of the proposed revetment structure, you see the approximate line of the existing beach profile shown by a solid line. Above this, shown in a dotted line, is the indicative and anticipated future beach profile. It's worth noting, however, that this particular section is taken immediately next door to one of the groins that is being built out into the sea, where, due to longshore drift, one would anticipate the beach level to be rising well above the average or normal condition. The bottom section, section 3.2, this is taken through one of the isolated access stairs up and over the back wall and down onto the level of the promenade. In this we see, going from the left hand side, that the new structure is 3.1 meters above the level of the existing Clarence Esplanade. It's to be noted that in this location, the road is actually being raised at this access point above the existing level, and that is shown by the dark grey hatched area. The dotted lines immediately beyond the centre point of the stair show the line of the wall which continues beyond immediately after this isolated access. Highlighted on the left-hand side of the drawing are a series of horizontal lines which are each located at one metre intervals. These enable you to actually ascertain for yourself the vertical scales on this drawing. This section is not taken immediately adjacent to a groin. In fact, this section is taken roughly midpoint along the beach. In this situation, what we see on the right-hand side is that the approximate and anticipated level of the future beach profile is lower than the level of the existing beach. On the third drawing sheet, we see in section 3.3 atop a tiered concrete revetment structure with various terraces and promenades at different levels. To the back of this, we see that the wall onto the common is 3.8 metres high, or roughly 12.5 feet. I'm about 1.7 metres high. On the right hand side of this drawing, we see datums marked. These show datum levels for the mean high water and low water and the levels anticipated in the years 2100 and 2064. What is apparent from these is that there is no beach in this location, or for that matter, in the other two previous locations in the sections in the year 2100. The beach vanishes completely. The bottom section shows a typical groin. This is intended to stop longshore drift and transverse energy out of the sea. And against these, beach shingle will pile up. The strategy for South Sea's current sea defence proposals is perhaps well explained by these diagrams. In the top row, we have the existing frontage. Running from the top left-hand drawing, you can see that at the back we have South Sea Common, then we have the road, the promenade and the beach running down to the sea. And the first drawing shows the condition currently at low tide. The next drawing shows the existing section at high tide. The sea rises and of course there is less of the beach. And what we know if we look at the right hand, the third drawing, we see that in the year 2100 the beach is overwhelmed, the promenade is overwhelmed, the sea floods into Portsmouth and this is the risk. 
The current ESCP frontage proposal is based on the following. South Sea Common again at the back, we have the road, and we have where this section is taken, a 3.1 metre high wall. The promenade is built on the top of the new revetment structure. The revetment leads down to the beach, the beach is diminished, and then we have the sea. That's low tide in the current situation in the left hand drawing. High tide in the current situation, the beach is lost, the tide comes in, the water laps against the revetment. In the year 2100, of course, the water level is far higher, comes up close to the top of the revetment, and the city is saved. But as you'll note, the ESCP proposal is defined and located by Clarence Esplanade. It's positioned between the Esplanade and the sea. In other words, the ESC proposal is contingent on retention of the road. So what is it intended that these revetments will look like? In their public consultations and publications, the East Sirland Coastal Partnership cite the new Cleveland frontage and promenade. This is located north of Blackpool and is described as an example of an extant coastal design. The two photos illustrate Cleveland frontage. What is notable here, however, is that the curving revetment structure of the type being proposed on South Sea's frontage is backed by a road and then there are houses immediately behind. So this may be an entirely appropriate form of defence where the city is located in close proximity. However, South Sea Common has between 0.3 kilometres and half a kilometre of land between the seafront and the houses. The illustration shows the ESCP proposals on the Clarence Esplanade. As these structures age, algae, lichen and erosion can be anticipated, and they won't be as pristine as appears in these photos of the newly completed works in Cleverley. And for children, the elderly, or any age for that matter, descending these revetments is far more hazardous than descending a beach, and the accessibility and amenity is greatly reduced. It's very important to look at the impact of these proposals at a human scale on sea views and access to South Sea's frontage, which these two images illustrate. The section on the left, which is taken at the maximum height, has the common located to the left and the beach located to the right, and is taken through the new revetment structure. It shows the scale relative to a car and a person at the level of the common, and a person then walking on the promenade above. You can see from this that there are no views from a car or from anyone who's walking along Clarence Esplanade. The image on the right, showing a couple with child, shows the impact of views to the seafront. In most locations, the revetment wall on South Sea Common's side has only a margin of planting at its base, with limited access taking you up onto the top. On this montage of Clarence Esplanade, the red wall accurately represents the height of the new revetment structure. In this we see the impact on the existing context. The red is ghosted, you can see the sea through it and beyond. Those are the views that will be lost. In this location we have Mozzarella Joe's, the restaurant that sits on the beachfront, and in the proposed ESCP scheme it's anticipated the Mozzarella Joe's will then sit on the top of this structure in a dominant location, a bit like a temple visible from all across the common. What seriously needs consideration, however, is that South Sea Common is inseparably part of the seafront and should be considered along with it conjunctively. In this further montage, looking east and beyond the Naval War Memorial, we see the impact again of the revetment structure upon the actual sea views from the common. Notably, the common in this location can be seen to be lower than the Esplanade, what we should ask ourselves, perhaps, is that in the 20th century, many of the UK's finest cities were destroyed by roads, now considered a liability. Are we in danger of doing something similar to Portsmouth's coastline? And with roughly 12% of Portsmouth's economy coming from tourism, is it necessary to also better consider the long-term economic and environmental impacts? If we then look at an overall plan of South Sea Common, overlaid with the proposals from the Eastern Servant Coastal Partnership, the revetment structure commences in the top left-hand corner of the drawing near Ravelin Moat, continues down around South Sea Castle and then along South Parade Beach. 
the entire area of Clarence Pier is not protected by the new revetment structure. This area is excluded from protection. Flood defence walls run to the rear of Clarence Pier. These incorporate roughly 16 flood defence gates to secure the land beyond in event of a storm, which is not a very robust solution in the long term because it entails considerable maintenance and cost. Analysis of land uses and areas also reveals that roads and parking account for roughly 16% of South Sea Commons total area. This is exceptionally high. For example, it's not dissimilar to the loss of one room in a four-room house when excluding the kitchen, bathroom and hall. To address these issues arising from the proposed sea defences, a design research and analysis exercise and programme entitled the Portsmouth Elephant Cage was set up in 2016. Funded by the Dutch Creative Industry Foundation, Architecture Locale and my own organisation, Project Compass, this was organised by myself, my colleague from the University, Francis Grave, and Dutch colleagues from Architecture Locale. For this programme, a range of mentors having expertise in water management internationally, landscape architects, engineers, architects and planners, joined the Elephant Cage. These included Julia Barfield, notable for the London Eye and the I360 in Brighton, Martin Kunch, who is an expert Dutch landscape architect, Matthias Bauer, responsible for post-Hurricane Sandy flood defences in New York, along with others having expertise in this particular area of Portsmouth and Southampton. They were joined by representatives of East Serling Coastal Partnership, St. Gunton, along with Denise Beck from Portsmouth. The mentors were then joined by 17 early career architects, landscape architects, engineers and planners, selected competitively by international competition. These in turn were supported by students from the Portsmouth School of Architecture and worked together in three teams over three days to explore different scenarios after extensive research and evaluation of the existing proposals. The first stage concluded with the three teams presenting to a public consultation critical and polemical designs they developed. These were formed by a range of long-term scenarios and evaluation of the existing proposition. Full description of these research outputs is available on PortsmouthIsland.uk. This was then followed by various site visits to innovative Dutch water management teams and the writing up of the findings overall and their application. A key strategic finding from this design review and research program is illustrated on this page. This identifies that alternative sea defence strategies are available. On the top row we have the current ESCP frontage proposal for holding the line, which was previously illustrated. The common is at the back, we have the road, the high wall, promenade, revetment and the beach, as sea levels rise, progressing to the entire loss of the beach. Beneath that is located an alternative proposal. At the back we have South Sea Common and a dike is moved further inland. Over the top of the dike, landscape is dressed down to an extensive level beach. In the current scenario, the left-hand drawing at the bottom row shows the current low tide. The middle drawing shows current high tide. And in the year 2100, we see climate change impact. Sea levels rise, a beach is retained and is still fully accessible has no concrete structure, a rock armour dike is buried, and the impact of the sea is first taken by the landscape builder on the gradual incline of the slope as proposed on the hard surface of a near vertiginous concrete wall, which is why this strategy is known as soft engineering. And this is entirely feasible if the existing road, parking and promenade are reconsidered, opening opportunity for an alternative and more appropriate sea defence strategy. Only a few miles east of here, across the channel, there's an excellent example of where this has been done at Catlings in the Netherlands. In the top illustration, we see a projection of the beach frontage. The sea is on the right. This breaks over an inclined beach, backed by the coastal landscape, in this case it's dunes, then leading down and across to the town. You'll see that this landscape is then draped over an underground dike and behind that an underground car park. 
This also acts as the groundwater drainage system. New beach cafes and events placed on the beach and the dunes and the landscape dresses over the dike provides enormous immunity. The schematic profile at the bottom shows how this defence structure works in engineering terms. There are essentially three lines of defence. The first is created by the beach, which takes the first impact wave energy. That's reinforced by dunes at the back, and then behind that, beneath the landscape, is the dike. Beyond the dike is the underground car parking, then leading to the town. This uses sand rather than a pebble beach, but of course in Portsmouth it's a pebble beach at the moment and that's what would be intended to more appropriate. This has the enormous advantage of delivering enviable quality, a completely accessible frontage that's ecologically viable and reinforces the entire economy of the town, whilst also removing parking. The genius of this sophisticated solution is that it is also hardly noticeable. This simple design model has been put together to explain the strategic design principles and options. Made from card, we have the sea on the left, the beach, of course it's made of pebble, backed by the road, and then South Sea Common. Maybe it's been named. The currently proposed strategy involves I put my ruler here, placing a concrete revetment on the beach and the promenade, which leads to loss of immunity, and access and views from the common are blocked. As sea rises, climate change, there's no beach. The alternative strategy proposal taking the same scenario of the sea, the beach, the road and the common, simply takes out the road and the promenade, places the dike further back in the landscape, and of course it doesn't need to be concrete either, drapes the landscape over that and down to the water's edge, retaining the beach and line, the graded landscape over provides extra amenity, and behind the dike is the new underground parking. The concealed dike and parking is located beneath the ground, delivering more public realm and a larger common. Now, as sea levels rise, the year 2100, a good beach is still retained, and so is all the immunity of the common, benefiting the city enormously. This defends South Sea into the future, with more and better public realm and immunity that is accessible, resilient and sustainable, while providing opportunity for future adaptation because the dike can be raised more easily. The alternative coastal defence strategy is then considered in this proposal. A new dike set parallel to the coast links together and repurposes the Rablin Wall and South Sea Castle battlements. The crest of the dike is shown in yellow. For many years the battlements have defended the cities and they can be repurposed for sea defences. They would be considerably higher than the green crest of the dike. A similar strategy can equally be applied between the lump forts at the East New Barracks. Underground parking is then provided behind the dike. This reduces the impact from cars all across the common and generates revenue. East of the castle, another new dike is backed by a water system, relieving drainage capacity in the Great Morass. The new dikes are buried under a naturalised landscape offering unimpeded beach access. East Selling Coastal Partnerships hard engineering solutions are retained around South Sea Castle, Nelson's Redoubt and South Parade further along where South Parade is backed by properties. The existing groins in their developments are also retained. 
This alternative proposal also considers the opportunities that are then offered for augmenting the city's economy now and for the future over the next 100 years. In this proposed sea defence strategy, Clarence Pier is addressed. This is done by redevelopment of the pier to provide a sea defence groin that reduces longshore drift and creates sheltered coves to either side. A lido is provided in the Ravelin long moat. An underground conference centre is proposed in close proximity to the hotels. And with the removal of surface parking, the Pyramids facility is relocated discreetly within the former D-Day Museum car park and within a more consolidated Castle Quarter. The transportation strategy provides new underground parking with transport access and servicing placed in proximity to all facilities including Clarence Pier, Conference Centre, the relocated Hopper Port and of course the beachfront. A public transport terminal and drop-off route connect directly with the underground garage. Blue arrows show service access to the beach and taken overall with the new underground garaging and the proposed rearrangement of the roads, the public usable area of the common is then larger. And when considered in the context of South Sea and Portsmouth overall, New connections and circulations give the opportunity for far better access directly to the seafront and along the promenade, and different levels parallel to the coast. The following explains some of the detail and rationale of these opportunities. If, for example, we look at Clarence Pier, which is an area that is currently half-owned by the City Council and a private company, we see that it is arranged parallel with the seafront. If, in future, it is to be redeveloped, which is highly likely given the current amenity and provision on the site, then what we see is any future development of any denser will have significant impact on views. This is the illustration shown on the top right-hand corner. If we regard this as a traditional seaside pier and rotated it through 90 degrees, any redevelopment of this site would have a reduced impact on views from the city returns significantly greater development value because much more of its surface would have sea views and by constructing it effectively on a pier type structure it would also act as a groin along the seafront. This could be affected by the simple act of a land swap for the phasing of its development. The current ground level volumes might then be raised increasing the site's development density to provide a singular and identifiable form along the coastline, effectively like a lighthouse. In this, there could be a range of amenities, some black box activities located within the pier structure, and this is illustrated by the images on this page. In the long curtain moat adjacent to the Ravelin wall, by cleaning it out, adjusting the sluices, and constructing simple pontoons, a wonderful south-facing lido could also be developed irrespectively of the type of coastal defence structure. This would further enhance the Portsmouth visitor experience, extend the swimming season and its amenity, attracting people to use the frontage. There are a number of such examples, highly successful temporary lidos across Europe. And to be able to compete with other cities, Portsmouth needs to look ahead. Bournemouth, Brighton, Blackpool all have multi-purpose centres available for conferences, music, film and other such activities. It's therefore proposed an underground conference centre could also be built adjacent to the car park. This would sustain all new and existing facilities and immunity, enhance inward investment and further contribute to expanding the project funding and the city economy. The rectangle of the conference centre is shown organised around an oval light well, but in all events, most activities within a conference centre are black box. There are a large number of successful underground conference centres internationally, which have been financed by progressive municipal authorities working with the private sector. If building new infrastructure, Portsmouth also needs to consider how it may best deploy this. In the area of the Great Morass, which because it is so low-lying and beneath sea level is also liable to flooding from rainstorms, the sea defence structure can serve an important purpose. 
by capturing surface water in a sustainable urban drainage system that is then stored within cisterns to the back of whatever form of sea defence structure is implemented, the limited capacity that Portsmouth already has within its drainage system can be significantly increased. In the Great Morass, this is addressed by capturing the rainstorm surface water in the sustainable urban drainage system that can discharge into the systems. The systems are intricately buried unobtrusively behind the sea defences and excess water can be stored there in a 370 metre long, 4 metre diameter sewer pipe. And this is more than is currently provided. The water can then be appropriately pumped into the sea. Along with general ground water balancing, the system can also be used to provide emergency pump storage backup for low-lying ground if the sea defences are overtopped. The integration of strategies this way is termed a blue-green resilience strategy, and this complements the city's future drainage management capacity. Along the seafront, there are also a number of listed monuments and structures. If significant work is to be done along the frontage, it seems perhaps inappropriate to simply lift them up and place them in the same location on any new structure without adequate consideration. It may be appropriate to consider what may make a more fitting setting. With the monuments in particular, many of them are sandwiched at the moment between ice cream stalls and hamburger bars. And it may be far more appropriate they are gathered together into a considered landscape ensemble with the Naval War Memorial. This could offer a powerful, focused and evocative setting, improving their stature. Again, with the Naval War Memorial, its location close to the sea has meant that since its initial erection, it has been suffering significant erosion from salt water. Despite recent renovation, much of the stonework is still seriously corroding. Protecting the monument better for the future should be an aspiration. In this proposal, it's therefore relocated in the long term onto the crest of the dike so that the memorial itself is apparent at the end of vistas from the streets within the city and better protected from the sea air. For South Sea Common, the alternative can deliver a coastal defence and landscape strategy that's sustainable, resilient, enjoyed by all, and importantly, fit for the future. This ensures that the investment in the city's sea defences provides a positive opportunity that can also deliver long-term benefits for enhancing Portsmouth's future economy. Portsmouth and South Sea can have a vision, because there is another way. This presentation recommends that the current policy of holding the line should be reviewed to allow for the development of the most appropriate, high quality and best value coastal defences for Portsmouth, with the public offered a genuine choice from all available coastal design strategy scenarios through proper consultation. Economic and environmental impact assessments of any proposed sea defences should fully evaluate all approaches relating to Flood Cell 1, including these alternatives, and they should do so in a city-wide context. Her Majesty's Treasury Green Books provides for the balance of risk, value and cost to be iterated forward in the development of business planning. This iterative process should be fully and reasonably engaged as the greatest risk lies in it being a simple, linear process. From the requirements for new sea defences, a better seafront should be developed that's appropriate to the city's context and aims to enhance its assets and ecology. With roughly 86.28 million being invested on Flood Cell 1, the design of the new sea defences needs to be more thoroughly considered, with the investment better deployed to maximise the benefits to the city. Further levering of investment should be explored and alternative scenarios studied for addressing the long-term risks, the opportunities and the rewards. On this page, showing an image of the overall landscape strategy, you can find details of the digital links to the full report on this proposal. 
the links to the Facebook campaign, which is at South Sea Seafront at Risk, a link to further questions and answers to some issues that have been raised over the report, and a link to a public petition calling for this matter to be further considered. I hope you may share with me a vision for a better Portsmouth. Thank you.